Good afternoon. My name is Tim Basta. I'm an undergraduate mechanical engineer at Montana State University, the Montana Space Grant Consortium and their Borealis High Altitude Ballooning Program. Uh, I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about uh, our developments in our zero pressure flight system. Uh, today I'll talk about uh, the motivation for uh, our zero pressure valve project, uh, some of the design considerations that we had going in, our uh, three prototypes that we've been through, and then a few of our plans for the future. Uh, just a, a, quick, a few quick facts about um, what high altitude ballooning means to us at Borealis. Uh, we use a latex weather balloon, a burst balloon. Uh, we have never flown a traditional zero pressure balloon, so um, we're attempting to make modifications to a latex weather balloon to fly at neutral buoyancy. <laughs> For tracking and communication, we're now using an iridium satellite modem, which uh, provides us flight updates on position, altitude, vertical velocity, real time. And these report to a website that was developed by my colleague, Scott Miller. And uh, this afternoon, he'll talk a little bit more about this system and uh, the website. Uh, this also allows us in uh, real-time control of our flight systems, uplinking of commands and uh, downlinking of data packets. Uh, so why neutral buoyancy flight? Um, we started talking last summer and uh, it obviously allows for longer access to the high altitude environment uh, for things like time sensitive data and uh, video of events like an upcoming eclipse, that we, an eclipse project that we might be working on. Uh, it also provides greater control over the flight track. Uh, stay aloft for a few more minutes to avoid something like a mountain or a water feature. There's certainly that uh, that option. So why why do university ballooning groups not traditionally use a zero pressure balloon? Uh, they're several times more expensive than a latex weather weather balloon, and uh, there's some difficulties in launching. Uh, in Montana, it's fairly windy, so ground conditions are rarely favorable for that type of launch. So we talked about uh, creating a zero pressure valve that we could connect to our latex weather balloon to allow us to vent a quantity of helium at a certain altitude to allow us to fly at neutral buoyancy. Uh, so we wanted, uh, yes, interface with latex burst balloons. We wanted to allow for our fixed altitude flight and uh, in-flight control of that to hopefully be able to uh, pilot the winds at different altitudes. Uh, we wanted the valve system to be reusable. Obviously, you don't have very uh, very good cost efficiency if you have to recreate a complicated system every time. And we also needed to integrate a flight termination system. Uh, z uh, zero pressure, you're essentially uh, making a derelict balloon. You need to be able to terminate that flight when you're ready to come back down. Uh, so here we have just kind of a traditional payload chain. Uh, and rather than a, a normal cut down system that severs the line between the balloon, we actually have our zero pressure valve. Uh, which connects directly to the valve nozzle and uh, connects us to our parachute in a traditional high altitude ballooning payload chain. Uh, so we'll talk about our first prototype. Uh, this was last summer we developed this. Uh, we used a small half inch diameter flow rate that was, uh, or flow tube that was uh, uh, restricted by a rubber diaphragm and basically we were venting or experimenting with venting helium by using a servo to interrupt that diaphragm. Uh, this picture is a little confusing but we have our um, uh, prototype one right here connected to a 200 gram weather balloon that's essentially essentially flying as a passenger to our main 2,000 gram balloon payload just as a uh, uh, test. So we flew um, three times with this last summer. Uh, our first flight we actually uh, burst our 200 gram weather balloon. We failed to vent any helium. Uh, our second flight we successfully deflated the 200 gram balloon. So for flight three we attempted to uh, vent from our 2,000 gram main balloon and um, we actually went up to around 100,000 feet and then manually terminated flight but we failed to vent enough on uh, flight number three. So after that summer we walked away with a few uh, conclusions. We proved that our uh, diaphragm had a sufficiently low leak rate where we could actually cause balloons to burst. I mean it wasn't leaking on its own. Uh, this also provided us with some insight into our flow rate calculations. Uh, we, you know, were we able to actually vent enough from a 2,000 gram balloon with such a small uh, flow orifice? Uh, then we came back and last fall we built our um, prototype number two. This time we used a circular gate valve design. We'll watch a video on that in a couple minutes. Um, we attempted to create an autonomous vent control using um, logic and an Arduino uh, circuit board. And this time we used a 1.5 inch diameter flow tube. 
So our uh, flight termination for this system, as uh, unlikely as it sounds, we used a tethered projectile. We actually had a launcher that was attached to one of our payload containers that uh, in the event that we needed to terminate a flight would shoot a tethered composite arrow from the container up into the canopy of the balloon to help induce burst. And we actually have a video of this. So the, uh, the system is actually right here connected to our payload. So if you look very carefully in this region, you'll actually see the dart exit the launcher and enter the canopy of the balloon. And it will play again in slow motion after real time. So we had some success with uh, projectile flight termination. So our results for our second prototype are, we only flew uh, one time with this. It did provide the flight with a very low descent rate. Uh, we essentially vented uh, a little bit too much helium, so we went into a, a very slow descent. We didn't have time to wait to see if it would come to uh, float equilibrium. Uh, we uh, terminated our flight using our valve. We essentially vented as much helium as we could to uh, cause the balloon to descend. But we walked away with some good conclusions from that flight as well. We proved that the valve could provide an adequate flow rate to uh, achieve neutral buoyancy and to terminate the flight. Uh, the control system was successful, but we had some questions about our autonomous venting software. So here's a flight track and an ascent profile for that flight. I think it holds the record for the longest Borealis flight. It was a, a 200 mile downrange distance. So it, uh, it made for a long recovery day. Uh, so then we came to our third prototype. We're um, currently using this one. It's flown three times. Uh, we were able to decrease the weight, and now we're using a manual vent control from our uh, for uplinking commands to, from our um, satellite modem. We included an onboard differential pressure sensor that we've had some success with. We'll have a look at that data in a minute just to um, provide some insight into things like flow rate and valve behavior during the flight. And uh, we were able to miniaturize and uh, integrate that flight termination system into the valve itself. Uh, so here are a couple of 3D models of our um, valve system with the uh, flow tube shown halved so you can see the internal geometry. And here are a few of the, uh, the finer points of our um, construction. Uh, so this actually um, is shown horizontal and we uh, dock our balloon to this section and uh, secure it to the pipe below this ridge and uh, connect our satellite modem uh, up to our valve system via a CAT5 connector that controls our um, flight termination and vent servos. Uh, here's kind of a bottom view. We can see the um, helium vent gate here. It's shown in open position. And uh, here we have a video. There we go. So we can see that uh, by uplinking commands to our uh, satellite modem, we can open and close that uh, vent orifice. Uh, here's a front view showing our flight termination partially docked in the vent system. It actually um, uh, goes inside the valve and uh, locks, interlocks inside to protect it during descent. So now our um, flight termination dart is actually being fired inside the balloon and out through the top of the canopy. Uh, here's the flight termination system shown external of the valve. Uh, a few of the finer points. Um, we have a retrieval cable spool to enable us to uh, keep that dart from falling back down after we fire it. And uh, some results from our third prototype, our first flight, we actually had, um, I think, a first for Borealis, a neutral buoyancy flight. And we tested our flight termination system after it was miniaturized, and we successfully terminated the flight. Our second flight at the beginning of the summer provided us uh, near neutral buoyancy, but um, we were attempting to float at 90,000 feet. We overshot our mark a little bit, and uh, our balloon burst at 94,000 feet uh, when we were almost at equilibrium. We were down to, I think, uh, one foot per second ascent rate. And then uh, flight three actually provided another neutral buoyancy flight, and uh, we floated for, I think, 20 minutes, and then our um, balloon burst, we believe, uh, due to a flaw in the latex. Uh, so here's flight one, uh, flight track. We're able to actually go um, downrange. Here we have um, um, our burst location was right here. 
So we actually uh, achieved uh, 84,000 feet and uh, traveled at float downrange and then um, terminated flight here and uh, landed here. Here's our ascent profile for our first neutral buoyancy flight. We can see that it, um, for anyone that's familiar with this type of ascent profile, it uh, follows the same ascent profile as a traditional neutral buoyancy flight or a traditional burst balloon flight. But then after our uh, open and closed valve event, we can see that our um, ascent velocity uh, decreases and then eventually uh, flattens out for a 15 minute uh, neutral buoyant uh, flight time. And then we can see that same trend in our vertical velocity that after our um, opening and closing our valve, our uh, ascent velocity decreases drastically and eventually tapers down to zero. Uh, our second flight track, very similar to our first one. Uh, in, this, in this flight, we actually had success with our um, differential pressure sensor, but here we actually vented five times and we can see the same trend where the um, ascent profile slows down after every uh, uh, venting command. Um, uh, and the same, yes, with our vertical velocity, we can see that um, these vertical bars are our command state and we can see a reduction in our vertical velocity as a result of uh, helium venting. Um, this is our uh, differential pressure that we measured between our valve and the ambient pressure. So we can see that um, right when our valve is open, we actually are uh, experiencing a much lower differential pressure inside the valve, which tells us that physically our valve is open and there's nothing uh, bizarre going on at altitude. Uh, here's our third flight, flight track, uh, similar to the other two. Um, again, the ascent profile, we can see that after uh, a short vent time, we actually do uh, taper off and go into float. Uh, the same with our uh, vertical velocity and the same with our differential pressure. It lets us know that our valve was actually open and uh, functional during this time period. Uh, so now I wanted to take a closer look at our vertical velocity for the three flights. Um, the gray bar represents our um, vent time and we can see that we are linearly decreasing our vertical velocity during the uh, vent time. So we can overlay all three flights and we notice that the uh, slope of the uh, vertical velocity decrease is the same for all three flights. So uh, we believe that we can use this to uh, predict uh, vent time versus float altitude on future flights. And it shows that we have a degree of consistency with our system. Uh, so a few conclusions from the project entirely. Um, we know we now have a successful vent flow rate and our uh, vent gate geometry can uh, vent enough helium in a short amount of time. Uh, we have achieved neutral buoyancy on several flights with uh, latex weather balloon. We know that our in-flight control of our uh, balloon altitude is uh, achievable. That We can actually um, uh, vent and go to lower altitudes um, and our flight termination compatible with valve system was uh, successful. A uh, few plans for the future, we want to be able to um, pilot the balloon through different wind layers to um, alter our um, landing point and uh, to get a longer flight, <clears throat> a longer flight track over a, with a shorter recovery distance. Uh, we also want to develop a ballast system to kind of work in conjunction with the valve to help us uh, fine tune our float altitude or maybe go up, go up again after we have uh, vented. We also want to develop a flight termination system with a higher percentage of reliability that maybe doesn't involve uh, projectiles. Uh, just thank you to MSGC and uh, Borealis and everyone at our program that's worked with me on these systems. And, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, yes? I was, I was curious in the, the video showing the balloon bursting with sure. projectile. Sure. It burst, clearly, but it right. didn't seem to me that it burst starting at the location the projectile struck it, which seemed odd to me. Sure. Do you, um, know, do you concur with that observation? Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, if that's true, why did that happen? Um, I'm not sure if it was the shock of the projectile hitting the canopy. Uh, when we uh, issued the flight termination command, we were very near 100,000 feet, so the balloon material was already reaching the uh, threshold of its... Um, uh, strength, so it could have been uh, just the force of the impact induced burst. I, I don't think it's likely that uh, it burst at the exact second the projectile reached it by way of coincidence, but um, I'm not sure why it doesn't appear to uh, burst from the point of impact of the projectile. How do you fill the balloon with this system on it? 
oh, we actually uh, transfer it. We have a, a section of PVC connected to our fill tanks, and after the balloon is full and we've measured it with a ballast weight to ensure that we have the appropriate amount of lift, we actually carry it by hand over to the valve system and uh, seat it and uh, connect it to the valve before flight. But there, there have been talks about having a, uh, an integrated fill nozzle on the side of the valve so we could connect the balloon beforehand and fill through the, through the valve. Yes? What powers your projectile? Is it spring loaded or compressed it, gas? Or? Uh, no, it's a compression spring. It's a, an entirely mechanical system that the uh, servo activates on command from the satellite modem. It uh, uh, tows a lightweight uh, cable behind it. Yes? What kind of safety procedures do you have for that during setup? Um, uh, well, the, uh, the, system, the system is armed uh, well away from the fill station, uh, but not loaded, essentially. The projectile is not, uh, not in a position where it could be fired. Uh, safety glasses are worn by the ground crew nearby at all times. And uh, just before we connect the balloon to the valve system, essentially the projectile is uh, loaded and always uh, facing upright in a safe direction. Yes? I'm curious about the type of students who are working on this project. Sure. Uh, engineers? Yeah, we have uh, uh, multiple uh, disciplines. My colleague Scott Miller, who's here today, is a, a computer hardware engineer. Um, Jameson Motley is a mechanical engineer. Uh, Nicole and I are also mechanical engineers. Um, we've had other electrical engineers work with us on the project as well. No physics guy? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Yes? It was a very nice uh, presentation, very nice project. Um, Thank you. Are there any concerns? I, I noticed you used the word pilot, uh, the balloon, um, in your presentation. Is, are there any concerns about uh, reaching the point where this unmanned aerial system well we we already have cut down mechanisms so we're, we're controlling at some level sure you know, these balloon flights but I'll let you well we we use the term uh, pilot very loosely um, obviously uh, you're a victim to the uh, the, the windage and your own flight track but uh, I, I guess it it just gives us a, uh, a slightly higher degree of control and that we might be able to um, pick you know, the jet stream or a certain wind layer and uh, linger there longer than a burst balloon normally would be able to, uh, to just allow us to adjust our flight track. But um, I don't think that you know, even pilot is an appropriate term for that since you know, a degree of accuracy to where we land is still you know, very low. Yes? What is the valve actually made of? Uh, the valve itself is made of uh, Schedule 40 inch and a half PVC, the main body of it. We're working on replacing that with uh, carbon fiber. Um, so we can look at that again if you want. Um, we have a carbon fiber servo bracket in this section that we uh, created to reduce weight, but the main body is actually just uh, PVC. Uh, I mean, the majority of the components on here were from the hardware store, essentially, uh, repurposed. Uh, yeah. So you fly Kmont balloons? Uh, this, I, I'm curious because that looks bigger than I would think could fit in the neck of a Kmont balloon. Right, right. We, uh, yeah, we fly uh, Kmont 2,000 gram balloons. Um, and the uh, valve nozzle, I mean, we, we don't have to um, uh, stretch it too much. I mean, it's actually a very uh, nice fit for this size. Uh, valve insert where it's uh, snug but not you know we don't have to really uh, stretch it to get it on there we usually use uh, uh, zip ties to hold it beneath that balloon retention ridge to make sure that our valve doesn't uh, slip out during flight there's another question No, we do actually. Um, it's a little bit different game since uh, traditional high, alti high altitude balloon termination revolves around uh, severing your connecting cable between your payload and your balloon, which is uh, kind of a trivial matter when compared to uh, compromising the canopy. Uh, the word now is lasers. We're going to go through some tests with a high intensity laser housed inside the valve to uh, essentially uh, compromise the top of the canopy from inside again. And there are a few other ideas. Uh, fairly crazy that are bouncing around right now, but uh, we're, we're in testing to replace the projectile. Yes? How do you guys determine like, how much air or how much helium to send out? Or do you have a model that you guys are using? 
Uh, we've been uh, attempting to fit a few models. Uh, just this summer, we uh, acquired our differential pressure data, which really um, drives all your flow rate calculations. And uh, mostly we've been uh, comparing um, how we can affect our ascent velocity uh, based on different vent times. So uh, as of yet, we don't have a, a solid model work, uh, fit to this yet, but we're definitely working on it. It's our next step. Uh, essentially, what, what we want on the back end is um, uh, vent for this long at this altitude if you want to float at X. So if you're shooting for an 85,000 foot uh, float duration, then you need to vent at some point before maybe 70,000 feet for 10 minutes and then allow it to reach equilibrium at 80,000 feet, something like that. Uh, we're, we're nearly there. <laughs> 